Hello, my name is Tristram Hooley and I'm delivering a series of lectures for the Inland Norway University of Applied Sciences, looking at the context for career. In this session, I'm going to be looking at automation, which has received a lot of attention over recent years as being something that is reshaping people's careers. But the discussion of automation is nothing new. The economist John Maynard Keynes was discussing the impact that automation might have on people's lives and careers back in 1930. He argued that the problem that people were going to have to deal with was that they were going to have more leisure than ever. They were going to have to think about how to spend their time when work, paid work in particular, no longer structured their time. And he hoped that people would use this to the good of themselves, but also to the good of the, the community and to those less fortunate than themselves. However, the debate in recent years has not really followed Keynes's argument. Whereas Keynes argued that automation would ultimately be a huge benefit for society, um, recent thinkers have tended to view automation as a problem, something which diminishes humanity. So if we look at some recent headlines, we see some things like this. High tech reaches the high seas with the era, era of self-sailing ships or driverless tractors and weed killing robots used in smart farming. And all of this leads us to panic about the number of jobs that might disappear, which people will come up with a variety of different predictions, but all of them quite terrifying. The argument here is that there will be no work for people. And so the idea of pursuing a career when there's no paid work because robots are doing so much of the work is extremely worrying to people. And that's without even worrying about some of the more alarmist uh, ideas that are associated with automation. So uh, killer robots, for example. So this begs the question, how is work changing? Are we actually seeing this kind of shift? Well, on one level, we definitely have seen some very important shifts in the way that work is organized. So if we look at this factory, car factory, and then at a similar car factory, maybe 30, 40 years later, we can see some pretty, a pretty big change and automation clearly has made a very big difference. Uh, similarly, in the area of logistics, we might be uh, on the verge of a similar change. So whereas uh, many people currently work in logistics, tr moving things around countries, uh, so in, in trains and, and um, lorries and also in, in boats as well, if, if we now move into a situation of self-driving cars, such as were being developed by Google, we perhaps what move into a worrying situation where there are, those jobs disappear as well. Uh, this is Watson, uh, who, who was a, uh, a robot that was developed mainly for medical purposes, but, but was also competing in this game show, Jeopardy, the game show, uh, very popular in America. And what, what they found was that this uh, robot could outperform human beings. And so this is, uh, you know, again, something that was supposed to be a fun game show. Even there, robots are, are having a very powerful impact. We also see robots being able to do some new forms of innovation. So this is a, a, a pendulum, a multiple pendulum. It, it's very complicated in the way it works. Uh, a robot was programmed to experiment with it and develop theories about how it operated and was, was able to do that. So robots are starting to move beyond just physical jobs and actually take over various forms of things that we might have thought were previously human focused. So experimentation, participation in games, and then ultimately in forms of creativity. Now we can argue about whether the things these robots are doing are really creative and whether they are really anything other than simply pattern recognition. Uh, but the, the truth is that the, this discussion and debate about the role of auto automation and artificial intelligence has become an important political debate. And of course, as careers professionals, you should remember that you are not immune. Uh, it's possible to imagine situations where clients' questions might be uh, 
uh, channeled to a robot advisor, perhaps drawing on a range of career theory in some kind of gamified environment, drawing on big labor market data, the kind of contextual data that, that it's very difficult for humans to fully understand, and then providing answers to client questions. And in fact, such a thing already exists in the IBM Watson career coach. So that's, if we remember back to that Watson computer that I showed you that was participating in the Jeopardy uh, competition, Jeopardy quiz show, they've used that technology to create a careers advisor, if you will. So many people have been discussing the political implications of this, and a very useful book for this is Martin Ford's Rise of the Robots. He argues that robots are gradually taking over more and more work, and that we only need things to carry on going in the present direction for a fundamental change to society to happen. This will re result in a dramatic shift of the economy in favour of capital. His argument is that in historically, um, capital, so money, employers have needed workers to get things done. Uh, and that's been one of the main mechanisms for redistributing wealth around society salaries so you pay people to do work and you have to give them some of your money and that redistributes wealth around society if you don't do that anymore it, because you have robots doing the job ultimately um, you end up in a situation where uh, workers get poorer and poorer because they can't find any work and and the consequence of that that the ford sketches out is that the problem is that ultimately as a capitalist you have nothing to sell because no one can afford to buy it so you actually ultimately undermine your own market because you by making goods more more and more cheaply and increasing your profit you're also removing more and more people from the market who can buy so martin ford's book is is a a, a fearful book where he says that actually if we um, increase automation and increase automation, we end up undermining capitalism altogether. So there are some big questions before we get too panicky about this. The first one is, is this imminent? It doesn't perhaps feel that it's that imminent. I mean, we have been hearing about this for a long while. Secondly, will robots actually be better liked and better than humans at many jobs. Yes, there are some jobs that they can easily replace human beings in, but there are also others that it's more difficult. What are the ethical issues? What if a robot kills someone by accident? Who's responsible for that? The, these kinds of legal issues are likely to cause long-term delays in, in the speed at which automation will become an important social and economic uh, factor. Is automation always gonna be cheaper? even perhaps in, than, than labor in the third world. It, it's, it's questionable whether you can build robots, replace them, maintain them and so on, necessarily cheaper than you can do human beings. Will these economic changes actually stimulate the creation of new jobs? Many people would argue that that's what's happened in previous periods, that when you've had areas which have automated or, or areas of the economy which have changed or, or disappeared for whatever reason, that that has then led to new kinds of jobs, new forms of work emerging. And then finally, is this about technolo technology alone or does politics have a role to play in this? And as I discussed in the last lecture on digitization, often technological change is strongly in intertwined with political change. So, I turn now to a book by uh, Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams, which in a way is an answer to Martin Ford's book. They argue that robots won't replace us. They can be used in a variety of ways. It all really depends who's in control of those robots. And so the question then is, is that we need to make sure that robots make life better for workers rather than for capital. And so workers in this case, and if we're thinking about career, workers will have to embrace change. It may be that the jobs they're doing might change. Perhaps, as Cernicek and Williams argue, they might want to start working a four-day week. But then, like as uh, Keynes's discussion at the beginning of this lecture, we might find that people have more spare time, more time to think about what they're going to do with the rest of their time and do forms of work that are not paid. This might be an exciting 
possibility, but it does require uh, us to find a way to give people enough money to live on. Um, and in uh, Cerny Check and Williams uh, book, they discuss the importance of what they call universal basic income. So the idea that everybody would receive some kind of income, even if they don't work or in addition to what they earn from work. So the message then is more hopeful, but it's also more politically contingent. Robots won't necessarily replace us. They won't. They might take up some of the jobs that we don't want to do. But if if we're going to continue to have a society which is actually going to be effective and in which people are going to be able to pursue uh, careers and build a good life and have access to well-being, then we're going to need to find new ways to organise it. So this fits in with a strand of thinking which which is sometimes described as Homo Faber. Um, so Homo Faber is the idea that work is not just paid work it's broader work but also that work is central to human beings human beings need work because it's about how we transform the world around us it describes our creativity it also describes our relationships with other people and how we contribute to society and to our families so this kind of point of, of thought helps us to, to rethink what work is. It encourages us to think that perhaps when we're talking to people about their careers, we're not only talking about paid work, but also about uh, other forms of work. So perhaps housework, care work, parenting, hobbies, and so on. And this kind of perspective would say, well, there's no worry that work is going to run out because until all the paintings have been painted, the novels written, or the scientific discoveries made, we're not going to run out of work. So this takes us towards the leisure society that Keynes imagines. If we have more leisure, how would we use it? And this, I think, increases the need for guidance rather than diminishing it. What are we, how are we going to spend our time if much of our, the things that we were going to do for paid work were no longer, are no longer required? So in conclusion, I think we can say that robots are indeed changing the world. Automation is changing the world. The future is difficult to predict, and it may not happen in the same way as many people are arguing at the moment. But there's a lot to fight for and argue about, about how this happens. And so when we're talking about career, I think we should be very sceptical about simply advising people to adapt to automation. We also need to be talking to people about how they shape automation influence the societies in which they live and and shape the way that their work is changed and altered as automation affects it and i think career guidance can play a wide range of roles in this kind of struggle for a new and different sort of world here's some references that hopefully you might find useful um, and thank you for listening <laughs>